Sorry, guys, we got cut off. Um, let's. Where was I? Okay, so the, we were talking about this. Got cut off. I'm known for that because I always get distracted and I forget to look in my bottom right corner or bottom left corner of my screen to see how much time I have left of my video. Anyway, so let's continue on with embracing a more positive self-image. So having realistic expectations, like I was saying. So, you know, obviously you should shoot for the stars, but take the proper steps to get there. Don't expect, hey, I'm going to have my PhD by 25. And that's kind of unrealistic in a way. Uh, for instance, I am 26 and I have my master's. Um, and I could, if I would have maybe not taken a break from my education, maybe I could have my doctorate by now if I wanted to, but it would be definitely a stretch. Um, so setting realistic expectations for yourself. And then have the will to change. So don't get stuck in that self-concept that you had of yourself when you were younger change is okay. It's scary, but it, you can change your image of yourself to be more positive and then have the skill to change. So having the skill to change, um, you kind of, um, have to take advice and learn more from books. So Get that skill level to be able to change. Sometimes it's a self-help book. Sometimes it's if you want to become, let's say, a better public speaker, take a speech class and learn those skills so that you can change that your image to be more positive. All right, so there's also the breakdown of how we communicate with culture, gender, and so on, um, which I find really, really interesting. Gender is kind of straightforward. You get those um, kind of gender roles pushed on you from a young age, a lot of in our, a lot of times in our society, which is horrible, but, you know, we're trying to change that, hopefully. Um, but a lot of times, your self-esteem and your self-concept of yourself is based off of your gender. And for instance, some parents raise their kids to think, oh, if you're a boy, you have to be strong and tough and you can't cry. And then for a girl, you have to be pretty and kind and all those other sugar and spice sort of things. Um, and so when you're not those things, a lot of times your self-esteem takes a hit because you're like, oh, I'm not like this, so obviously I'm not, you know, I'm not strong, so obviously I'm not a true boy, or I'm not pretty, and I'm not really, you know, kind and nice all the time, so obviously I'm not a good girl. So that, you know, affects your self-esteem and your self-concept of yourself. You know, I, because I'm a girl, I have to be pretty, or I have to be kind, or because I'm a boy, I have to be tough and strong, and I can't cry. And then this is where it I gets even more interesting is culture. A lot of times this is um, the Western society versus Eastern society or Asian um, cultures, if you will. So Western cultures, like our culture, United States, this area of the map, if you will, uh, were very individualistic. So it's a lot about eyes and what I want and what I want for myself and how I want to um, change myself and how I want to be perceived and how I want to grow individually. While Asian cultures and a lot of Eastern cultures are more about collectivism, which means that they get their identity a lot of times from where they live and the people that they are a part of. So a very uh, normal ideal for them is if I hurt you, I hurt myself. 
So they think that if they hurt their people or even one person in the same culture as them and same belief system as them, then they hurt themselves. They are a unit. They work as a unit all the time, which is often also why a lot of Asian cultures will describe themselves when they're making that list, which is part of your activity for this week. Um, the who am I questions at the beginning of the chapter on page 62. Um, which I am flipping to and I'm to give you some examples. So moods, appearances, um, intellectual capacity, strong beliefs, social rules, physical conditions, stuff like that. A lot of Asian cultures, just like as in the book said, they'll start with describing where they live and oops, um, where they live and what their religion is because that is more of a collective thing. We are a people. We are Buddhist. We are. Um, sorry, I'm like running out of religions really quickly, and it's just whew, over my head. Um, or we live in this certain section of the, this certain city, and as a people, we are this. So they think collectively, not individually. And then they go down the list where we would go, um, where we would start, they would go down. And what's most important to us, like our name or um, the skill sets that we have as individuals, they would, that would be lower on their list while that would be one of our number ones on our list. Okay. So the self-fulfilling prophecy, I love that they have this in the book because I never really thought of this as um, a self-concept theory in a way. I always learned about self-fulfilling prophecies in literature, especially mythology um, and tragedies that are written a lot of times. It's all about self-fulfilling prophecies. So a prophecy is said and you can't avoid it in a way, but then self-fulfilling prophecy also, they're like, um, I'm never going to do this or whatever or whatnot, and they set expectations for themselves and um, ends up either going the right way, but not in the way they expected, or going opposite. It's just, it's um, a very big thing in literature, so it was really cool that it ended up in here. So self-fulfilling prophecy is a person's expectations of an event and his or her subsequent behavior based on those expectations make the event more likely to occur. So if you're saying, I am going to fail at this, um, why even bother trying? Then uh, most likely you're gonna fail at it um, because you're not taking the steps to, uh, to make a more positive outcome. For instance, uh, you're not that good at math and you it's it's a struggle for you and instead of studying for that math test you're like i'm already going to fail anyway why bother studying you're self-fulfilling your prophecy by not studying and perhaps doing better on the exam than you will if you don't study and therefore of course your test is going to show that um you did badly because your expectations of an event affected the behavior and then prophecies imposed by one person or another. This is also, that was more of a self-imposed prophecy, um, the example I just gave. But then there's prophecies imposed by one person or another, which I'm just calling, because um, they didn't really give a title for it, because they have self-imposed prophecies, which, prophecies, which I kind of feel like is a title. So I just did, um, I know I titled this something else. Sorry, guys. You know when you make notes for things and then you lose them? Because that's what I'm going through right now. Okay. And then I just called it Other Imposed Prophecies just so I could give it a title in my notes. And that's really when um, they give you an ex uh example in the book about an experiment that they did with teachers and that's a lot of uh that's a great example so i'm just gonna base that off of it um 
in the textbook where they gave these teachers a list of students that said, hey, these students tested um, at a really high IQ level, they're going to do well. And they had no test results. They just told the teachers that. And then these students didn't do so well, so whatever. So this other person, without even trying, um, self-consciously, really, they imposed their, oh, these kids are going to do well. So they kind of gave more effort towards them subconsciously. And they were like, oh, these students aren't really going to understand it. So they didn't push them as hard. And because of that, it was a self-imposed property. And those students who were on that list saying, oh, they have a higher IQ, so they're going to do better, even though they don't, that was just a fake test results, they did better because they were pushed more to do better because of the teachers believing um, this information about them and imposing those expectations on them. So impression management. Ooh, slide three. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to go into part three. Sorry, guys. Um, so, impression management: uh, the communication strategies that people use to influence how others view them. So, your perceived self and the presenting self, or your face. So, everybody kind of has those two concepts in themselves: this uh, perceived self, how we perceive ourselves, and kind of like that hidden identity that we keep secret some levels some people know but most of the time it's something that we keep secret like how we act when we're listening to music in our bedrooms and we dance really crazy or we sing really off key and that's something that we wouldn't probably want other people to know that we do or we pretend we're on performing on a stage in our bedroom when we're singing to this music and we probably wouldn't tell other people that we're doing this because it's our perceived self it's something we keep hidden and then presenting self. This is the self that we want everybody to think we are. So if we want people to think we're super serious and super uh, mature and whatever, that's the, what we act like. We dress like that, we speak like that, and we keep that facade up, even though we might be in our, when we go home at night, in our bedrooms, we might dance really crazy and pretend we're performing on a stage. Um, so there's two separate sides and sometimes those sides are closer together as in who we show our, who we present ourselves as or is the same is closer to how we perceive ourselves and what we kind of do behind closed doors but a lot some a lot of times they're a little farther apart all right so presenting the self uh, communication as impression management so um characteristics of impression management we strive to construct multiple identities just like i was saying before impression management is collaborative and impression management can be deliberate or unconscious and then why do we manage impressions to start and manage relationship most of the time social um and job related because obviously a lot of times the, the way we react or and act around our friends is not the way we're going to act around our employers and then to gain compliance of others. So a lot of times, if you want maybe a friendship or with someone or someone to comply with what you want and you know that they react better if you act more demure and more calm. So you give yourself the impression or give them the impression that you are a calm, collected sort of person and they are more likely to comply with you then. And then to save other spaces, a lot of times um, we manage impressions. So if someone is super into believing that they're really funny and it would probably give them a really mental breakdown to not think they're funny, you, you sort of laugh at all their jokes just so that you save their face, you save their self-concept. And then to explore new selves. To explore other identities that you have because people are multifaceted we have layers so sometimes you want to explore those layers to see if you know maybe you're um, also you know you've been told you're a musician all your life but maybe you're also a writer or maybe you're also an actor who knows so explore other selves other parts of yourself so I'm about to run out of time in this video 
stay tuned for part three.